can coffee kill you? That's certainly a question in the 17th and 18th century. Coffee is introduced into Europe about 1650s for Great Britain and a little bit later for France, and it starts to become very, very popular. And this is also the time when medical science well, really starts to get more scientific, as it were. And people are starting to ask these questions about particular food things, especially new food items. Coffee, tea, and chocolate are both very popular, especially by the time we get to the late or the early 18th century, when they are cheap enough for even everyday folks to afford. So a lot of people are drinking this, uh, especially in the morning and different parts of the, the medical you know, community, as it were, are looking into these ideas and saying, uh, are there poor, are there bad effects to coffee, tea, chocolate? And they're writing whole treatises, pamphlets, uh, multiple people about the history of coffee, about the history of tea, and then how to you know, properly uh, you know, prepare it. And then what are the effects of this? And coffee is one that has a little bit of controversy back and forth. And it's kind of fun to read these um, controversial pamphlets at times. Okay, nobody in the 18th century thought coffee was going to kill you but they certainly thought it might have some bad effects. Maybe it'll stunt your growth. Maybe it'll make you impotent. Um, you know, it certainly isn't good for people with nervous disorders. So we, we certainly have multiple people pointing out some problems. Some thought that it was a waste for working class people to spend a lot of money on coffee. They should probably drink beer instead. It will be more healthy. Or, you know, you might have somebody extreme like Benjamin Franklin. They should be drinking water <laughs> instead of beer. So there, there are some authors that thought maybe it was too wasteful, that these working class people were, you know, kind of wasting their money. Um, and uh, also, you know, that whole idea of it'll kind of stunt your growth, right? Um, so there, there are some authors about that. But it seems like when we really dig in that most of these medical people were very, very pro-coffee. Pro uh, there's at least one pamphlet that talks about coffee being good for the plague. Now, I don't know about that. Uh, other people thought it was good for, um, you know, all sorts of breathing issues, that it clears the mind. So let's take a step back and think about coffee being introduced into Europe in this middle of the 17th century time period. It's coming in and uh, since it isn't being imported in large quantities, it's uh, very expensive and a specialized drink. There, there was uh, the, the whole getting started with coffee in England comes from a per one particular servant from the Turkish region. And he has the knowledge to prepare coffee. And, and he prepares it in one gentleman's house. And every time guests come over, they badger him about this drink. And it becomes, you know, people start to come to his house so much that he's like, fine, let's open a coffee house. Let's move this out of my house because it's driving me crazy. All these people want to drink this special drink. So, it can be very, very expensive in that time period. So 1650, 1660, and it takes off. Coffee houses, that whole idea of we're gonna have just a house and all you're gonna drink here is coffee, it becomes a thing in this late 17th century time period in England. And of course, when uh, you know working class people see that and they, they, they can't quite afford that, it, Cre creates a great demand for that. And that's when, you know, we finally get to the early 18th century, coffee starts to be grown in other places like the West Indies and the price comes down and boy, it's just a great demand for this wonderful stimulating drink. There are multiple treatises on coffee. Here's one from 1792. And he's talking about the effects of coffee. Uh, Bacon, Francis Bacon says, coffee comforts the head and the heart and helps digestion. Now, this is Francis Bacon writing before 
coffee even gets introduced to Great Britain. So he's writing about what travelers are saying about coffee. And then we have, um, then we have Dr. Willis. He says, being daily drunk, it wonderfully clears and enlightens each part of the soul and disperses all the clouds of every function. And the celebrated Dr. Harvey used it often. And Voltaire lived almost upon it. He told me nothing exhilarated his spirits more than the smell of coffee. He even had it roasted in his house every morning just so he could smell it roasting. Now, it's funny, there's a bunch of different references to um, coffee stimulating you, keeping you from being uh, sleepy. And yet, here's this little beginning uh, right before the directions for preparing coffees in the secrets in arts and trades. Note, this coffee is much used among people of quality who prefer it to strengthen the stomach, especially when taken before going to bed. Which seems odd. We some people talk about you know coffee being very stimulating, and other people talk about it helping you go to sleep. Some of the language uh, written about coffee here, and this is early, early 18th century, is a little over the top. But this is fun. Uh, Tis allowed to be a strong antihypnotic, greatly dissipating sleepy vapors and the fumes of wine. So. If you're a little hungover, then, then coffee's going to do you good things. Um, Tis likewise useful to such as are afflicted with rheumatic and gouty humors. And then, I love the section down here where it says, um, which coffee by which a right use supports the vital flame. So this author was so concerned about that coffee that you just really, really had to have it that, I mean, it, all, it almost kept you alive as opposed to, you know, will it kill you? This author seemed to think you, you needed it to live. There are authors here that specifically point out times and places when coffee is not good for you. And here is a section, uh, but on the other hand, he disallows the use of it to such as paralytic, and likewise such as are troubled with melancholy vapors or have hot brains. So maybe hot brains is a nervous temperament, maybe? I think we've, we've seen that in some other writings where uh, if you have a, you're a nervous kind of person, coffee's just going to be a little too much for you. Here's an author that's speaking to the problems with coffee and people with nervous dispositions. He says, but in thin and dry constitutions, they, the drinking coffee, um, are very hurtful as they dry the nerves too much and are apt to make them tremble as with palsies. And by the same means, likewise, they promote watching by the bracing of the fibers too tense for that relaxation, which is necessary for them to sleep. Occasionally, we see the idea of impotence and sterility pop up. This may come basically from one source earlier on. Here's what this reads. Uh, Coffee then produces sterility in Persians, not because it is cold, but because it gradually dries their bodies by means of a certain sulfur. And it kind of talks about this kind of warm and cold humors. There are some medical ideas that are holdovers from the medieval era that are coming into here. Um, so, you know, as we get into, now that kind of sticks around all the way into the 19th century, but here they're still grasping at straws as to why coffee would have, well, any sort of effect. They didn't have the ability to analyze coffee and break down the why of any of this. They didn't know that ca caffeine was in coffee um, or basically any of these things. They were just looking at the effects and kind of guessing as to the why. In this book called The Treatise of Food, he says, coffee fortifies the stomach and the brain. It promotes digestion. It allays headache. It suppresses the fumes caused by wine and other spiritous liquors. It promotes urine and opens some people's bodies. That it makes the memory 
and fancy, more quick, and people brisk that drink it. I think it's fascinating as we dig into these treatises and pamphlets written on coffee, different scientific thought. Uh, we've got some major thinkers here uh, working on the idea of coffee. Is it bad? Is it good? How is it good? Why is it good? And they come up with some crazy ideas here and there. It's really kind of funny to read them. And you know, we can look back at the 18th century scientists and doctors and kind of make fun of them, but we still have that same issue today, don't we? You know, doctors talk about, oh, butter's good for you, and then somebody else will come out with a different study. Bad, butter's bad for you, and the same thing with coffee. Even to this day, some people will think coffee cures everything, and other, other people might think mm, coffee's probably bad for you. You should only maybe drink one cup a day. So can coffee kill you? Well, I don't think it's gonna kill you. In fact, I think it smells wonderful and the vast majority of authors in the 18th century and probably even today think coffee's probably good for you. <laughs>